All right, great. So welcome everyone. Um, this is our last session of the track training with Paralympians. Um, I'm Caroline Bell. I'm the senior manager at Blaze Sports. Um, and as I mentioned last week at Blaze, we offer a variety of training and education courses, and we are excited to offer this series on the sport of uh, racing and track. Um, a few housekeeping um, things to be mindful of. Um, this is recorded. Make sure your mic is muted. Um, we will send out the recording following this. Um, and we are hoping to put both of the recordings on our website. So if there's ever a time later on that you'd like to review that, you can find it on our website. I'm going to do an abridged version of our intros for uh, Daniel and Krieger since we covered more in depth their story last week. Um, but here, let me let these two people in real quick. Second. Okay. All right. So Daniel Romanchuk started to specialize in wheelchair track and road racing at 16 years old and has since won Paralympic gold and bronze medals, um, as well as the Boston, Chicago, London, and New York City marathons. Krieger Shabord is a highly decorated athlete as a six-time Paralympian and four-time world champion. He also has excelled in long-distance racing. And just to name a few of these, um, he is a four-time Los Angeles Marathon winner and a two-time New York City Marathon winner as well. Um, so we are excited for them to continue to share their knowledge with us. Um, and I will hand the mic over to our, our, our experts. Great to uh, great that everyone could join us. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, and I really uh, um, we're going to cover quite a lot. Um, part of which is going to be the compensator, and uh, so that's oftentimes quite a quite a, a kind of a, a mystery for a lot of people. Um, and I really can't think of a, a better uh, person to be doing the session with than Krieger. Uh, yeah, over the years, he's taught me uh, a lot of little tips and tricks uh, about that, and. Uh, so hopefully we're uh, we're going to take some of that mystery out of it uh, today. Um, but we're going to start with uh, just getting into the chair. And so um, first of all, make sure that you've got your helmet. And uh, second, if uh, you're unfamiliar with the chair or uh, that you're getting into or, uh, you know, kind of getting into chairs in general, make sure you got someone holding that front end down so that it doesn't flip over. And uh, so I kind of just kind of s put my feet on the kneeling pan and then just slide back um, and kind of sit down and it kind of just kind of shift around till I uh, kind of feel comfortable where I am. Uh, but there is no right or wrong with getting into uh, getting in or out of the chair. Um, really, it's uh, it's just depends on, you know, what uh, what, you know, sometimes what bends, what doesn't um, and uh, what you can do, all that stuff. Um, but a great way to uh, to get some ideas on how you might want to try and get into the chair is to go to YouTube and uh, look for Wheels of Fire. Uh, and so they've put out a uh, compilation of uh, you know people getting into their chairs in different ways, and uh, so you might get some ideas from them. And so uh, before we start to uh, to push the chair, though, uh, we should be uh, you know let's learn about uh, how to control the direction of the chair. And so the direction of the chair is basically ultimately determined by the direction of the front wheel. Uh, and so the first uh, way that we can control the direction of the front wheel is called hipping, and it's basically just throwing your weight around. So just kind of popping the front wheel a little bit, um, and uh, it certainly takes some time to kind of learn how to do that. Um, and uh, it, it, it's kind of similar to how you, know, you would eventually learn how to kind of adjust your, uh, you know, your um, your direction in your day chair without touching the hand rings. And uh, so uh, the one thing about it is that you do have to, uh, to be tight in your chair. Uh, if, you're, if there's a lot of space in your chair, uh, it's not going to work well because just the, the energy won't transfer into the chair. 
Um, and uh, that, that's actually probably one of the, uh, the least noticeable yet most common ways we kind of fine tune our direction. And uh, um, yeah, even if you set your compensator perfectly on the track, uh, and we'll get into setting the compensator later, but you know, even if you set it perfectly, you're still gonna have to make little adjustments in the middle of a race. Uh, and so the second way we can uh, change direction is using the steering. And so I've got the steering here and basically that I can turn the front wheel using that. Uh, the one thing about it though, is we really try and use it as little as possible. Um, and th that's just because when you're steering, you can't be pushing uh, or you can do kind of a half and half deal, uh, one arm on the steering, one arm pushing. Uh, but again, the more we can spend pushing, the better. So uh, we really just use it on the road to go around big turns or sharp, you know, sharper turns or, uh, you know, in scenarios where we really need to, to turn quickly. Uh, so say someone steps out in front of you when you're, uh, you're on the track or something like that. And uh, so that pretty much brings us to the, uh, the last way that we can... Uh, kind of adjust our direction, and that is using the compensator system. And so you can see, basically, if I use it, that kind of turns the front wheel a little bit. And so this is kind of what we use on the track. And so to kind of go into um, some of the um, some of the, uh, the the parts of it. Um, so starting at the front, you've got the front fork, which holds the front wheel, and then you've got an arm sticking off of the front fork, and you've got a clamp on here that connects to this piece, and this piece is actually called the compensator, uh, but I oftentimes will refer to it as the cylinder, and uh, at the back end, you can see that it is attached to the track control here, and so... Um, you can see kind of from an overview, if uh, I kind of whoop, getting cables mixed up here. Um, so you can see if I basically hit this on the left, that will kind of move or kind of push the whole compensator forward, which pushes the fork arm forward, turning the wheel left. And so uh, again, if you kind of zoom in on the uh, compensator itself, the distance from this point to this point, the anchor points of the compensator or the cylinder don't actually change. So I'm going to hit on the left again. So you can see how the whole thing just pushed forward. And uh, so it's kind of the, the same thing on the uh, on the right. If I hit it on the right, that brings my wheel to straight. And uh, again, if you zoom in, when I hit it on the right, that distance does not change. It just pulls everything back. And uh, so uh, we will use this on uh, on the track, of course. And uh, so it's, it's a way that we can just set our default direction and go straight back to pushing. So we don't have to constantly be worrying about steering or anything like that. And actually, Reminding that uh, when I uh, said constantly worrying about steering, that's actually something that uh, I see a lot with beginners is you know, they're on the track and you know they hit the compensator and it, say it's a little off or they hit it early, late, something like that. And you know they notice they're starting to veer off and they go straight to the steering. And this is not a habit that you want to get into. Uh, because again, the more time you spend steering, the less time you spend pushing. So try and rely on hipping or uh, and you know, really just nailing down how to use the compensator. Uh, and something you can do actually is uh, just kind of sitting in the chair, not even moving. You can kind of just say hit it on the right and say straight, turn, straight, turn and just go back and forth. And then to, to kind of mix it up, you can actually have a coach say the straight or turn and say, okay, turn, turn, straight. And so you just really ingrain how hard you need to hit it, you know, what side you need to hit it. 
and uh, things like that. Um, and so the one thing, though, is so say I'm on the track and I'm in lane four and I hit the compensator and wow, that's a lot of turn. And I start going into lane three. I could crash. So how do we limit or determine how much we turn? And that's using the little screws on the side of the compensator here. And uh, for actually doing that, I'm going to turn things over to Krieger. OK, all right, Daniel, thank you so much. That made my job really easy. Um, uh, the, the track control, there is there's definitely a little bit magic to the to the track control. Um, you know, you you definitely need your steering um, on the road more and on the track. You use your track control and that is this triangle little piece. And that's why it's called the track control. It controls your angle or your direction in direction on the track. Some of them are a little bit different to this. Some of them are oval or a little bit different shape. But the most common one that you will see on chairs is this shape. It's pretty big, so uh, designed so you won't miss it. You know, if you go on speed, a fast speed, and you hit and you miss it, then you know if it's too tiny, you know at least you have a, lot, a, a good bit of surface here. So yeah, so the 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 track control is underneath, uh, sometimes up top, but mostly underneath the frame. Um, and then you'll see those two little set screws on the sides that Daniel pointed out to you guys. So those are the ones that's going to give you your um, your set directions. So the one on the left side is for the. Yeah. No, it's got like this. The, the one on the left side is um, for the left curve or for the, for the curve on the track that is to your left. And the one on the right side is for the straight. Now, it's really easy to uh, to get a little bit confused with it. But the best way to practice this is just to go and be on the track and see how many times you can you know, bring it out of uh, the directions and set it again. Bring it out of directions and set it again. Or do different lanes. Uh, do lane one and lane three and lane, say, and lane seven. So at first, you can first do your straight away, and that will be your right side. So if your chair, if you hit it on the right side for the straight, and it's going to go too much to your right, you want it into your left a little bit, so you're going to release this the screw on the on the right side. Release a little bit, and then you're going to tap it again, and then you're going to follow your line and see if it's going to stay in that in that straight line. Um, and then once once you have your straight fixed, you're gonna you're gonna pick your lane. Say for instance, you're gonna go lane three. Okay, so once you get to lane three, you start your curve. You're gonna hit it on the left side. And the front wheel is going to move to the left, just like Daniel showed. So, okay, now I'm in lane three and I'm pushing. Okay, now remember, you're not steering now. The chair is steering for you. Now I'm pushing, but the chair is going too far to the left. So you want it to come in a little bit to the right because you're going to go to lane two. So what you do is you just turn your knob in a little bit so it 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 corrects your your direction for a longer curve, slightly longer longer curve. So your radius will be a very very tiny little bit bigger than uh, when it's when it's all the way out. When it's all the way out, it brings your radius kind of tight. So, but also you know when when you do this, I mean this is kind of magic. But the real magic is to uh, in your ability to do the steering in your hips, you know, those small body movements, what they call hipping, you got to be able to hip. Now, you know, if you are, um, uh, if your injury is a higher level, um, your compensator settings should be just be more right on. You know, I or Daniel, you know, we have uh, our injuries is pretty low, so we have a good ability to move that front wheel to the left and right. But you gotta you gotta be able to to um, to have it right on if you you know if you're not allowed to do some hipping in your in your in your chair. Though there can be some um, 
um, like technical issues with this um, and of course with your cylinder or your compensator that connects to the front here. So there's your, your connection. Um, now typical issues when you're steering, I mean, you feel like you my steering is right on, but still my chair doesn't run in line. Sometimes it, it goes to the left too much or it rattles or it goes to both directions. Then there's a couple of things you, you can check out. Okay. So first, if you on the track and you start hitting it and sometimes it just goes by itself, that means that this is too loose. There's a big old nut underneath, underneath here. That nut, has to be tightened, uh, but also not too tight. You don't want to over tighten it because then you won't be able to move this. So it's got to be in the right spot to be able to move it, but also not flop by itself. Okay, so it's that's that number one point. Um, the other, uh, let me see here, Lincoln. Okay, all right. So um, at times, say for instance, you are on the track and you hit it, but your chair is still not, and the, and the the set screw is already maxed out, but it still doesn't go far enough to the left. Now, what you want to do then is you want to lengthen. Remember, Daniel said those set points here, those two anchor points, uh, can be adjusted longer or shorter. And the way to do that is there are two little nuts at the end here, and those two nuts, either one of them, you can just release, and then you can you can turn it. See, it, it makes it longer or shorter. If it makes it longer, it's going to push it more to the left. If it's going to make it shorter, it's going to pull in and it's going to make, make it more to the right. So you'll, like, you'll just have to see what works best for you. Then when you, when you do have it set, always remember those two nuts at the end here, those two nuts, if they are not tightened all the way against the shoulder of the cylinder, it's got to be pushed all the way tight to the cylinder. Um, if it's not, it's going to make a rattling noise and it might just turn by itself. So you all, always want to have those two nuts nice and tight. It has happened several times. It's not the greatest moment, but this rod end, this little end, it's got an eye that fix, fix to the, um, that anchors to the, the, the fork and the frame. It can break. It's not the greatest moment because if it breaks, your chair goes, poof, you know, in any direction then. Um, but they are replaceable. There it is. That is called a, uh, a rod end and you get these at hard, like hardware stores. You just take yours off and take it to the hardware store and see what size it is. But yeah, they are replaceable. Um, for play, I think, I think I got it for play. There is maybe a few more things, but we are uh, our time limit. So Daniel, I'm gonna I'm gonna zip it back to you again. All righty. Uh, so we're going to go into brakes next. So just to kind of go over the general anatomy of the brake, you've got the lever here. Um, this can be mounted in a couple different places, but uh, basically it's the the only piece that's gonna look like this. Then you've got the brake cable, and that goes all the way to the brake assembly here at the front. And uh, so basically, when I press on the brake lever, that is going to squeeze that assembly, and uh, it's going to basically just rub on that front wheel to slowly stop me. And uh, so... Um, Basically, um, you can cut. Sorry. Oh, uh, so you can basically see you've got the brake pads here, which are what are actually coming in contact with the rim. And uh, so that's generally how it works. So a um, couple of things you want to make sure of is that First of all, that you don't that your brake lever doesn't bottom out. And by bottom out, I mean basically go to the point that it is touching, say, the steering handle or uh, anything else that might be here. So I've got a good amount of space here when I'm pressing down on it. Um, so I'm not concerned about bottoming out. However, if you are, 
you want to make sure of uh, basically if you are so this I'm about one finger away now. This is a little tight for me. Uh, so I would start to wonder about, you know, did something get bumped or, uh, you know, how do I need to adjust my uh, brakes? And if you look all the way out here towards the front where you, the brake cable gets clamped to the, uh, the whole assembly here, you see this little lever here. And that you can flip forwards and backwards. You want to make sure that's pointing forwards. Uh, and that will kind of tighten up the brake cable and you won't be bottoming out as much. If you're still concerned about bottoming out or if you still are bottoming out, you can bring it to a bike shop and uh, they'll help you out with uh, with you know anything you need to do there. It's not very complicated. However, if you're just unfamiliar with a brake system, just bring it into a bike shop and have them uh, show you what to do. So the, uh, the other thing that I wanna make sure of with my brakes is that if I lift the front end up and just spin the wheel, so you see it's not spinning very freely. You also might be able to hear a little bit of something rubbing there. And so uh, the thing that's happening here is the, well, the thing you can check for is are the brake pads here evenly spaced from the rim? So you can see on one side there's some space and on the other side there isn't really any space. So if that's the case, I can kind of grab the whole assembly and sh shift it a little bit and then lift the front end again, spin the front wheel, and it's spinning very freely. And I'm not really hearing anything either. So um, yeah, if you can quick just adjust the, uh, the whole assembly, that's great. But uh, again, if you're still rubbing, Bring it into a shop again not a very complicated fix but just one that's uh this best done by uh you know someone who's been working with the systems for a while um the uh kind of to wrap up brakes here the um we really want to use them as little as possible um and uh you know that's because they really don't work all that well uh so it takes you a while if you're going you know if i'm going full speed and just rely on the brake to stop i am certainly not stopping on the dime uh and so uh you definitely want to just be heads up uh, with your surroundings i'm oftentimes you know if i'm about to start sprinting at all i'm looking 100 meters ahead of me to see what's going on on the, the track or road or anything like that, uh, just to make sure that I've got enough time to, uh, to do whatever I need to do to avoid an accident. Um, so um, first of all, just be heads up. And second of all, you can you use, basically use the brake with one hand and with your other hand, either push on the hand ring, whoop, there's the hand ring. Push on the hand ring or on the tire uh, to slow yourself down a little bit faster. Um, the one thing, though, is if you are using uh, baseball gloves and you have the, uh, the hand ring that is attached with rubber washers to spokes, you don't want to grab the hand rings. It's very tempting, but uh, you really don't want to do that because if you do that, the hand ring is going to stop, but that spoke that's sandwiched between those nuts or those um, those washers is going to just come flying out forward, and you're just going to have two hand rings in your hands, and you're going somewhere you don't want to go. Um, so, you know, I've seen it happen. <laughs> just, uh, yeah, just keep that in mind. <laughs> um, and I think with that, we're back to Krieger. Great about the brakes, Daniel. Yep, no, very true. Um, brakes are something that uh, we don't want to use, but unfortunately, we need them. We need those brakes. Okay, I'm going to hop over and see if we can talk a little bit about the, you know, we're talking about all the brakes, but what is the, the, the brake um, going to, you know, catch to make you stop? Last week, remember, we talked about the rear wheels. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about the front wheels, okay? So you get diff different kinds of front wheels. Um, these are uh, only about 20 inches big. 
so they're quite a bit smaller than the rear wheels. There is not a lot of weight on the front wheel. Okay, so if you um, like when Daniel was talking about the brakes, uh, if you go a downhill and you go say 20 miles an hour and you have to use your brakes, these little front wheels are so tiny and there's so little weight on it that you're going to skid if you pump that brake full on. So basically, yeah, you're just going to feather it. But yeah, okay, so this is a spoke, a regular spoke wheel with a tubular tire, easy to fit on, on these uh, wheels. This is a uh, carbon fiber tri-spoke wheel, okay? Same size, just uh, a little bit fancier. It's uh, more in price, but not so much difference um, in performance. The front wheels are, I would say, all very similar. Uh, when it comes to performance. Okay, so I showed you those. And then, of course, I just want to show you this one again, the Kurima, this a deep section, and the tri-spoke, and a regular spoke wheel. Those are your three main ones. The front wheel attached to the fork, not like the rear wheels, attached to the fork like a bicycle from both sides, okay? So from the left and the right side. There is a, um, uh, a Allen, uh, Allen head um, bolt here, and on the right side. And when you fit your front wheel to the fork, like that, there's the fork, you're gonna fit it to the fork. Those two um, bolts will go on either side. Usually it fits well, sometimes it is that it's a little bit wider between the front, the fork and the, um, and the hub. You can add an axle, but you know, if mostly I just I just use the two bolts to bring them tightly together. What you're gonna need for that is back in my old toolbox and usually just grab a nice Allen wrench. This is five sixteenths. Um, but once you get your, your chair, you're gonna pick uh, pick your, your tools, what you need, a combination tool or either just something like this. That's it for wheels. Let's uh, let's push over again back to Daniel. Daniel, you there? Yep. All right. All righty. So oh, going, there you are. To, uh, going into the stroke, and so basically there are five phases of the stroke. There is contact, drive, release lift and stretch and accelerate and so basically um the um the uh so that, that is the the five phases of the stroke however um wow sorry uh, where was i going <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so um get it Eventually, basically, the, the goal is to be able to reach the bottom of the ring. Uh, for a lot of people, uh, you know, beginners, it's really, they're not going to reach to the bottom of the ring, uh, whether it's for, uh, you know, basically because of the equipment. Uh, oftentimes, it's not uh, not sized for, uh, for the athlete um, or something like that. And uh, basically, a lot of times in the in the beginning, people will oftentimes kind of just look like this, and basically that's just uh, you know part part of the the process of learning how to push. Um, so the goal again is to basically push as far down on the ring as possible, and then um, yeah, you know, again the they're not going to have much of a lift and stretch uh, at first. Again, that's just uh, something that people develop over time. Uh, I, I don't think I uh, had a really good lift and stretch until I was probably around 18. Um, and so uh, something that you can do is actually uh, have a, a broom handle or something like that, uh, kind of up at this level. Uh, and the goal is for them to touch the broom handle with their arms before they come back down for their next stroke. So after the release, lift and stretch, touch that broom handle, 
then go into the next stroke. Um, you know, that's, it requires a certain amount of power uh, as well. And so that's uh, something that, you know, may take time to develop. Um, and, um, sorry? Krieger. Um, yeah, so um, basically, uh, it, Krieger, do you have any, uh, any, any questions or uh, anything like that? <laughs> Yeah, I, I do. I do have a question. I would love to see you in a little bit action. Can you uh, can you show us a little bit what's in those uh, guns of yours? <laughs> All right. So. Oh, see how smooth Daniel looks. Isn't that amazing? It makes it look easy, right? It doesn't just come overnight. Something like that takes a long time, a lot of uh, muscle memory from the arms to the brain. Yep. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's cer certainly a, a long process uh, to, to get to this point. Um, and actually, um, you know, one of the great things about roller training is uh, that it's it's actually pretty pretty important to getting to uh, these points. You, know, you can do a lot of, uh, of stroke analysis. You, know, you take a video and uh, you know, at a high frame rate, you can slow it down and watch, you know, okay, I wanna you know, change this, do that. Um, so a lot of things uh, you can do there, a lot of time and uh, yeah. I have a question um, for you. Yes. <laughs> Um, I've seen beginners hitting that ring, not in the right uh, yep. spot. Can you kind of show so, where's the right way? And I'll try a, to. A lot of it. beginners will end up contacting the very top of the ring here and pushing like this. And so this isn't a very efficient stroke. Uh, so what you really want to be doing is contact the ring on the side. So not on the top here, but on the side of the, uh, the ring. And that will allow you to put much more power into things and keep your hand along the wheel for a lot longer. Because uh, if I try and push along the top of the ring, I can only get to around four, well, let's see, what. What what clock is this for you? Uh, say yeah, around four o'clock before I'm I I slip off the ring and can't push anymore. But if I am on the side of the ring, I can squeeze in and I stay on the ring till around seven or so. Um, question. There's a question here. Um, should you still try for a lift and stretch if you're a beginner and your equipment won't allow it? So, uh, generally speaking, um, it's it's hard to say. You don't want to get into too many bad habits. However, it you know, these are things that kind of evolve over time. So at first, you know, you can just do do whatever's best. Uh, you know, kind of do just short shorter strokes. Um, just reach as much of the ring as you can, um, but uh, eventually, um, eventually, when you try and you know get equipment that's more appropriately sized, that's you know the the goal is to try and aim for a lift and stretch. Uh, eventually, um, again, you might need to uh, to take some time and to develop power uh, to do that. Because I've seen a lot of people, you know, they're they're pushing, but the wheel just stops, you know, as soon as their hand leaves the uh, the push rim. Um, so again, that's just something that's going to take time to develop. Um, and so uh, you can just you can really do a lot of uh, kind of adjustments with the chair, even within a, a given setup of just you know trying foam here or there, uh, just trying to get you to a point where you can you know, really make contact with a lot of the ring. Um, and I think uh, we can go over kind of the, the starts, I think, next. And so uh, basically for starts, 
Um, yep, yeah, I prefer to start around, you know, halfway down the ring. And then uh, for because I'm a 54, uh, you know, and I have I have a lot of function. My injury is uh, pretty low. I actually on set will raise my upper body. And then when the gun goes off, I use my whole the weight of my upper body to drive that ring down. Uh, and so, um, but for a 53 or someone with, you know, maybe l l less core uh, function or something like that, they would not want to try and lift themselves up. They want to really just try and stay as low as possible when they're starting. Um, and uh, again, this is just something that you can, you can play around with and, uh, you know, see what works best for you. Uh, and I've think I'm going to hand things back off to Krieger. Great stuff, Daniel. Can, can we get just kind of a quick example of the uh, lift and stretch part of this stroke? I'm, yep, I'm going to turn the camera sideways okay. here. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, it, it, so go through it slowly and then up, up to speed probably. Yep. And so basically the lift and stretch starts, you know, starts after release, and some of it is shoulder. Although, again, for for 54s or you know people with a little bit uh, more function, they can also you know try and lift their body off of their knees and basically come up, you know, to a degree as high as they can. Uh, I actually, I I did, I I went to both ends of the spectrum here and. It, uh, you know, at first I wasn't lifting and stretching, then I was lifting and stretching too much. Uh, and so, again, it's something that you, you kind of just really, uh, you want to just, again, do that stroke analysis and uh, kind of fine tune things. Um, but yeah, full basically. Speed. So here, here's a full speed, maybe. Well, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry, we had to th we had to throw this together real fast here. <laughs> but, uh, basically, it's a fine line. You don't want to spend too much time in the lift and stretch and accelerate because you're not adding any power to the ring at that point. However, it's a great time to you know develop power that's gonna go into the ring. So yeah, it's a kind of a, a fine line. You don't want to spend too much time off the ring, but you want to spend time enough time off the ring to develop power to go into the ring. I think I, I think also, you know, when you're going slower, yep. there's not much lift there's and stretch really going on. Not much lift and stretch. So it's very similar to a start. Um, in that, yeah, you know, at first, you know, the stroke they're going to be very short just to get things moving. And as things gain, uh, you know, as you gain speed uh, and things kind of get a little bit more inertia, it's going to uh, kind of lengthen up. All right. Um, I think, Kriga, it's rollers time, right? Yes, we are. As we are on uh, rollers, uh, good time just to keep <laughs> going with it. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Yep. Um, so um, I want to show you a little bit more about rollers and what kind of rollers you have. Um, there's a good example of Daniel now on the roller, uh, but let me get to my photos here and see what I can share. <clears throat> uh, oh, oh yeah, wait, there you go. Okay, so this is an example of a very Good roller. It's uh, from Revolution Sports out of um, Canada. And you can see this is uh, quite a big, uh, heavy piece of equipment. Um, amazing, good tool for you guys to use. Um, uh, you just, this, th this kind of roller is one, if you set it down, it's basically going to be there for a while. You don't want to move it from one spot to the other. It's a little bit too heavy. Um, I'm going to show you another one that's uh, locally found. Uh, 
It is the Eagle Roller. And what is nice about this photo, this is actually with the ramp and everything. So you can actually leave this somewhere and you don't have to get in your racing chair um, while it's on top of the roller because it can be high, right? So you uh, you jump in your chair and you ride up to the roller and someone's just going to help you to tie it down and then voila, you're in position to go for your your workout. Show you a sink in the deck. Yeah, I've seen some people that have it down in their deck. So I've actually done done that before. So it's all the way down in my um, it was in my garage floor. So I just could jump right on it. Um, there's an example of what Daniel was in now. Um, this is uh, my roller that I make. Um, I can pull this one just on the chair like it is there. I can move around. It's got wheels in the back. I can move around anywhere if I'm if I need to, or just put it vertical with a chair with a chair on it. And also, I try to make this roller a little bit lower. So um, it is not as high as the other heavy duty rollers. It's kind of an in between roller. Uh, so it's easier to jump on and off when you are really, you know, in and out of your day chair. Then um, we have, uh, stop sharing. I want to give you an example of a good, nice little warm up roller. Let's do, um, there is another Eagle roller that is more like a warm-up roller. It's a, you can see this one is a little bit more lightweight. I haven't seen this one in action yet. It's an eagle as well as the one with a ramp. Um, but you can see this is lighter and it's, uh, you know, you can move it um, easier from one place to, to the other. And this is a travel warm-up roller that you can, um, where is it now, right here? That's a it's also a revolution sport. So if you go to an event, this is something you can carry with you. Um, this uh, it it comes apart. You know, you you can you can basically have it in a travel bag. So it is very helpful when you go to an event and also you know at home as well if you if you don't have space for the big rollers. But yeah, roller training is great. Like Daniel said, you know, it really actually started to take off with a lot of people during COVID. Um, we had big, big COVID, um, COVID, where, is, where are we now? We had big COVID training sessions, races, and group sessions. Uh, so it was ideal time, you know, for people to learn more about how they can um, get used to roller training. Um, you know, it's great for warm ups, of course, and of course, you know, a regular workout you can do on a, on a trainer if you don't have a road or a track near you. You can use a roller. If you don't have uh, a big space, you can get a smaller roller. Or, you know, if you have a large space, you can have a large one. But it's a great tool to have. And I, I suggest that if you are serious enough, yeah, you should, there's something you should think of. What do we have next, Daniel? Back to you again. Yeah, so uh, next is weight training. Um, and yes, these are not very heavy. <laughs> Um, and so really the, there's a reason for that. And, uh, you know, really wheelchair racing is not a very, you know, strength driven sport. Uh, it's very technique driven. And so, um, a lot of times we won't do too much with, uh, with weights, uh, with, with, you know, weights themselves. A lot of our work is body weight and, uh, you know, resistance bands, um, you know, medicine balls, you know, smaller weights. Um, there are some things that we do with bigger weights. Uh, however, you um, you really it's technique is much more uh, you know where you're gonna be able to uh, to, to make some uh, some progression in the sport. Um, and so um, you know, we basically just work on a lot of shoulder preservation because for a lot of us. That is our mobility. You know, our shoulder. If our shoulders go, we aren't going anywhere. And so, uh, you really want to make sure that everything is uh, is well maintained there. Uh, so, some simple things that you can do 
is basically, you know, say, take, you know, small thing. I think this is, you know, this is not even five pounds. Um, I think there might be one or two. And you could have one in each hand and basically do rainbows. Things, you know. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, my 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 the camera's having to go farther and farther back <laughs> with my arms going so high. Um, but yeah, the uh, so smaller weights, you know, doing a lot of stuff like that, just maintenance and uh, really get, maintaining flexibility uh, is a a big thing for us. Uh, so I think uh, it's back to you, Krieger. Good stuff. Um, yeah. I have to admit, I don't think I've ever seen someone sit in a day chair and bring his arms up and almost reach the ceiling. So, yeah, well, that's Daniel Romanchuk, <laughs> Mr. Long Arms. Well, Daniel. Um, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, coaching. Say, for instance, you are a coach and you have uh, at a school and you have one um, senior or junior or whatever that's in a racing chair. And you want to bring this athlete in as well to, you know, to have fun both ways. So there's there's ways you can you can work. Uh, so, you know, the athlete in a chair can um, can be combined with workout of uh, of your your able body runners. Uh, one thing that I always feel is important is the safety aspect there. Um, when you are on the track and there's runners. Um, see if you can have the inside lane or at least one and a half or two lanes for the wheelchair athlete. Um, a lot of times when you have runners on the track, they might just, you know, uh, stop their run and they just veer off to the right and, you know, off the track. So this way, if you have a wheelchair runner, a wheelchair racer on the track, and that athlete has to utilize the inside lanes only, not using the outside lanes and keep the, the runners in the outside lanes safer and um, definitely a way to, to bring them together. Um, for instance, if you say you do uh, 150s on the track, you know, you, are, you, have, you want to do eight 150s. Okay, now you have your runners and your, your wheelchair athlete. Yes, you can do that. Um, but if you if you do want a, uh, a even run for the wheelchair athlete, I would say usually if you are if I do it with my son, 150s on the track, he would stop at the finish line. We start 150. He would stop at the finish line, right? I mean, it's like dead stop basically, right? And he would turn around and he would he just walks back. For wheelies, we keep our momentum much longer. And like Daniel said earlier, if you tap your brake, you might just skip. You might even skip quite a while before you really stop. So just let your chair roll and that athlete in the chair, let him roll all the way around. No? Let him keep going around all the way back to the 150 start again. And then they meet each other back there. By the time um, the wheelchair athlete is there, the runners won't be there yet. He has a little bit of a time of, uh, of rest as well. So definitely there are ways to work with uh, the same kind of workouts. Uh, you just have to be, you know, thinking ahead of time what how you wanna how you wanna plan that. Right. Um, in short, that was it for together work tra trainings. Let's see what's up next, Daniel. Yeah. Uh, so next is just some basic tools and things that you should have with you pretty much at every practice. Uh, and I really even shouldn't say pretty much at every practice. You should have them at every practice. Um, is basically a, a set of Allen keys, both English and metric. Uh, if you don't want to get a whole set of keys, you can just find what keys you are you have to use to uh, basically take your wheels off, both the front and the uh, the back wheels, um, and make sure to tighten them before every practice. Um, and then I've also got an adjustable wrench here. Uh, always nice to uh, to have that on hand. And then, uh, in basically to finish off my my little pouch down here, I've got some super glue. So uh, if you use hard gloves and uh, you require you know glue on the gloves, you know you want to make sure to have some of this on hand if the glue starts to peel off. Um, then pretty much it's just 
you know, have a spare tire if uh, your tire goes in the middle of practice and some way to pump them up. Uh, so I think it's back to you. OK, yep, good stuff, Daniel. I, I, I can follow, you know, right where you stop there is basically if you want to do, go to an event, your, your prep for an event is going to start at home, right? Um, so I used to have a checklist. Um, especially when it came to triathlons, when I did triathlons, just because so many things I had, I had a written list where I had to tick them off, you know, goggles, gloves for, you know, whatever it might be. But, you know, even in, in uh, wheelchair racing, there's enough things that you can forget when you are at home, when you get to the track, um, uh, I forgot my gloves or a helmet or whatever. So I have a checklist, you know, you're safe then, right? So pack your stuff, your, you know, your goose and your tools and your snacks and that wonderful little pot with with all your tools um then next day or next morning you arrive at the track, the track. And track. you're gonna uh, someone's oh, no, okay you're gonna arrive at the track and then first thing i'd like to do is i go get my number right where are my numbers where do i register go get your number you're done with that so once you have your number Get it on your chair. Mostly the numbers go on your chair. Ask them, where does your number go? Does it go on the left side, right side, back side, helmet or whatever? But be sure you know where your numbers go. Uh, it's a little bit easier for able-bodied runners. You know, they just, you know, tap it on. It's always in the same place. But for us, a little bit different. That, um, OK, so at the track meet, a lot of times it's really hard to find time to get on the track to warm up. And it's not only for warm up. It's for setting your compensator and your, your, your track control curve. So ask when can I get on a track so I can have a decent warm up. And even if you cannot have a decent warm up, more important is get your track control steering set first. If you know you're going to do the 400 meter in an hour's time, you're going to be in lane three, set it for lane three, then you're done with it. If you cannot warm up on a track, maybe there's an outside area where you can still warm up a little bit but at least you've set your, your track control. Right, next moment, you're gonna say, uh, you're gonna be ready for your event. Just, you know, arrive there enough time so uh, you're not nervous and in a, a broken down situation. Uh, arrive at the start line on time so they can put you on your spot where you can, uh, where you can be on your marks, ready and go. Race. Time is always the funnest time of everything. All these little rituals has to go with it, you know, from the house to the start line. But once that gun goes, it sets the energy free, and that's the best time of, of, of racing. That's why we train so hard for. Done with your race. Um, uh, when you cross that finish line, it's always a good time for everyone. But uh, I think it's an important time as well to stay focused and keep in your lane. When you cross the finish line, just keep that line. If you're in lane four, just stay in lane four until you got your chair brings to goes to a, uh, a, a dead stop or a standstill. Don't spend forever on the track. Leave the track when you are, uh, there's the next opening because events are, are still rolling. In short, that was uh, race prep. Let's, uh, let's head back to, to Daniel. Um, I'm glad that I'm not the uh, the only person with the checklist. Uh, I, I think I have a four page long checklist uh, that I go through pretty much for every competition that could have uh, just whatever I need. Um, don't always bring all of it, but uh, I'm glad I'm not alone there. Uh, so to wrap up, basically, you really, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to you know learn and uh, progress in the sport whenever you go to, you know, ca camps or competitions. And uh, just a, a short list of, of, you know, camps and competitions uh, here. We've got the U of I wheelchair track camp uh, that's going to be uh, in June to July. And it's basically 12 to 19 years old. It's 400 to, uh, to register, and it's going to be in Champaign, Illinois. Um, and... Uh, the other camp, I, I think I'll, I'll hand it back to you, but uh, there are also 
uh, a couple of competitions that are, uh, I believe, linked down here. Um, so, you know, they're both put on by Move United. And uh, um, again, they're just great opportunities to, you know, learn from other racers and uh, to just, uh, just progress. Uh, so, Krieger, do you have, uh, you know, I'm sure you have a plenty more information about the Cedartown camp? Yes, uh, the Cedartown camp is in, it's in Georgia, and um, it is about an hour and 15 minutes from Atlanta. It's usually around July 4th, just before or just after. This year is just after. The big Peachtree road race or 10K in Atlanta is on July 4th, every year. And we have um, a training camp, which we call a training camp, but it's more training together camp. You know, mm -hmm. you, it's not a specific camp where you get coaching. You get coached by the Daniel Roman Chuck that's there, not officially, but you watch and you hang out and you share. Uh, and it's usually a time where we can just, um, you know, go out and train together with the top athletes in the world. It's been uh, going since the year 2000. This year, we will have the 20th. You know, we missed a couple of years, but this year is officially the 20th of Seattle 5K and um, the 5K and training camp. Now, the 5K is sort of kind of in the middle of the camp, but around that time of the 5K race, we have, you know, multiple training sessions where we can just... Uh, enjoy each other's uh, company. Um, it's also part of this year, um, we started something new. It's called the, the Triple Crown series. Now, a Triple Crown is consists of a 5K, a 10K, and a 15K races, okay? So July 4th is the 10K race, that's P3. Um, two days later is the 5K race in Town on the 6th. And on the 8th or the 9th is Boilermaker 15K in Upstate New York um, in Utica. So that is a Triple Crown Series, just to, uh, uh, an idea to bring athletes a little bit more united and give them the idea of how they compete against each other over a series. It's not like high intense series like the, the World Majors, the Marathon, but it's something a little bit more fun and uh, more relaxed. But you will be scored on points. Everyone will be scored on points, even if you are the lowest entry level beginners. Okay, um, I think from my end, um, I don't know what's uh, what's next for us, Daniel. Can I just say for junior athletes? Yeah. Sorry, I'm jumping in here. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm just speaking on behalf of the Sudan 5K again, just briefly. I'm Karen, I'm Krieger's wife. Um, I, I'm excited, Daniel, to see that the U of I camp is before the peach tree, and then our camp is directly after peach tree, the 4th through the 7th or 8th of July. And then the Move United Junior Nationals in Alabama is about an hour and a half from Cedartown again. Um, that is the week following. So there's a lot of opportunity for the young and junior athletes to compete in that end of June, beginning of July period. Thank you. Excellent. Um, I think we have a couple that that is just an incredible time. I remember sitting down at Cedar Town last year and just looking at all the athletes talking to each other and just hanging out and um, just learning from each other. So it wasn't really official training, but it uh, it really, I think, you know, a lot of information got exchanged. Um, a lot of uh, people just formed relationships that they'll carry on for a, for a very long time. So very cool uh, atmosphere there uh, at Cedar Town. Um, and so we had some, did Daniel go ahead? Okay. Agreeing. Okay. Yeah. Um, the, we had some questions in the chat. If we could just take a minute or two, I know we're, we're at our time here. Um, uh, Krieger, what on, uh, maybe you can take this one. Do you have any suggestions on a travel box for traveling by air with the racing chair? Oh, travel by air. Oh yeah, that can be a nightmare. It is uh, definitely uh, yo, 
an obstacle for everyone. Anyone that travels with a racing chair, you have to be prepared that something can happen, you know, because it's not only one person that's going to deal with your or work with your equipment. It will be several people that's going to work with your equipment and your equipment has to go in a plane and out of a plane at some point again and back to you, hopefully safely. Um, yeah, there are people that uh, or companies that do make travel boxes. I definitely suggest uh, Revolution Sports. They make, make an excellent box. They're back in Canada. Um, uh, same company that makes the, the roller that you, you, saw, you, you saw easier uh, earlier. But you can also, if you want to, make sure it's your own thing. Um, there are ways you can use. Uh, I've seen big trash cans that uh, people used, huge, huge trash cans that people use, and they bring it together. They, they tie it together somehow and uh, with rivets and whatever. But, you know, if you want to go all out and spend all that money on a travel box, yeah, there are, there are options for you. But uh, if you do travel with your racing chair, just like it is, do not check it in. You know, take it to the gate like you would travel with a with a uh, like a mom travel with a baby stroller. They go all the way to the gate. Your racing the chair you sit on is going to go all the way to the gate of the plane, and you're going to leave your your day chair and your racing chair together right there. I always travel with a very nice little. Um, uh, uh, like a notice on my racing chair. Love letter. Like a love letter, yes. Please handle with care. Thank you. You know, because these people, if they see something nice, you know, they might just be nice to your chair. So they don't always want to handle this big stuff. So if you just try to be, you know, uh, see all of their perspective as well, it will, those little things will help. You could maybe travel with uh, your spoke wheels and put your carbon fiber wheels in a wheel bag. Mm -hmm. That might be a, another way to be careful. Yep. So one, one thing that I've actually uh, done after, you know, a lot of chairs just kind of started to get lost and, you know, couldn't be found for days is I actually started to travel with, uh, with an air tag put in the case. And uh, that way, you know, I could at least know where it was. Uh, you know, it was sometimes, you know, they, you, you don't know where it is. Well, it, you know, it, if you do that, you can tell, okay, well, it's, it's back in, uh, you know, in Atlanta. I traveled from South Africa many, many years ago and back from South Africa to I had my address on Atlanta, Georgia, USA. My chair got lost. It went to the country, Georgia. <laughs> 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 I couldn't believe it. It was gone for a long time. Then I found it in the country, Georgia. So, but I found it eventually it came back to me and it was labeled country Georgia. <laughs> yeah, you know, like you say, it can go anywhere. Yep. Uh, um. So we had a question about hydration for um, while you're training or racing. Yeah. So I'll, I'll take this at first and then maybe shoot, shoot it off to you. Uh, so I basically, you know, have used just a, a camelback and, uh, you know, you can kind of put it, you can, there are many different ways, uh, like, just like getting in your chair, there's no, uh, no wrong way, but basically just attaching it to the chair. Uh, you know, I've seen it just kind of taped on the back or, uh, you know, various other uh, ways, you know, sometimes it's in a backpack um, and, uh, but basically just a, a basic camelback system. You've got uh, the, the, um, the bladder here, then goes, you know, the tube up to the, uh, the mouthpiece. Uh, and so pretty, pretty much, you know, just have enough tube to uh, get from wherever you put this up to your mouth. <laughs> yeah, some, some guys uh, just use a regular bicycle water ball as well with a little straw in, um, like a hard yep. straw as well. You can, you can do that, um, you know, because we all are so different you know i'm an amputee daniel's got legs someone's got one leg and you know someone's got big legs so you just have to find a space on your frame where you can have the water bottle where you can reach it um it might even be a water bottle you can grab and you can take a sip and just put it back again um if you drink a lot of water i wouldn't do or very often i wouldn't do that uh daniel's system is definitely the safer way to go there 
All right, um, and we did have a question. Any different race prep for marathons or triathlons? Um, Krigo, since you've done both, of, well, you both have done both of those, but you did triathlon on a little bit more than Daniel did. <laughs> Any different race prep for those? Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, um, the, the mentality for triathlon is, um, I would say it's quite mental because you feel like there's a thousand things coming to you where in a marathon it is, you know, physical race prep is going to be very similar, right? But it's the mental race prep that's going to be different to in, in, a, in a triathlon. Just because the, the, there is so many little things that can go wrong in a triathlon and you just have to be able to adapt if something goes wrong. In a, in a triathlon, you know, if you have a flat tire or whatever, you know, be pre pre prepared for anything that can go and have a solution. You know, there's always a way out. Um, I don't think, you know, I've ever not completed a uh, triathlon and I've done many and I've had to, you know, uh, I've done Ironman um, several times in Kona where the one time and now I, I compete uh, with the able bodies, we are a thousand five hundred athletes in Kona, starting all at the same time, at the same spot, uh, and they don't know I'm in a, you know, I'm an amputee or whatever, because they cannot see me. They just see my head. Uh, so, bam, the the, the 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 cannon goes, and then off we went, and someone hit me with his elbow or with his foot or whatever in my eye my goggle my my goggle went sideways like this and i swam 2.4 two and a half miles or 2.4 miles with a goggle just like that i thought you know i might stop have a little bit of tea and enjoy my time and adjust my goggles no my my mental prep there was you know i'm gonna stay in this fast group you know I'm going to swim with one goggle was good. The other, the other goggle was loaded with water, goggling inside. But I kept staying with that group. I never lost that group. And it gave me a, a, a real fast time in the swim. So mental prep, absolutely. All right. Um, this, is, this is one I, I want to know here. <laughs> and that is because we have a lot of beginners here. And when you're a beginner, things go wrong, right? You don't think about things, things happen. Um, I, I wanna know what's your most embarrassing race story? Um, what's the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you, either in a race or on the track? Uh, Daniel, you gonna take that one first? I'll try and take it first. Although it's really, it, Looking back on it, it's really it's less embarrassing and more of a, more of a learning moment. Um, and uh, so basically, I think it was my my first 800 meter. And so yeah, I was out out in some other lane. I did my first turn. And for for those of you who aren't familiar with an 800, you do the first turn in your lane. Then you're allowed to go into lane one and uh, complete the rest of the race. So I. It was, it was getting out of the turn, hit my compensator to go straight and said, okay, how am I going to get into lane one? Well, I'll just try and use my compensator again. Hit the compensator. Wow. <laughs> right in the infield. Didn't know what just happened. Was uh. very confused. Kind of embarrassed. Kind of, yeah, all over the place. Uh, but again, learning moment. Don't use your compensator to go change lanes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got another learning moment. I I, I was leading a race, and uh, this is short, but it's sweet and very embarrassing. I was leading a race to the line. At the finish line, I put my arms up like this. And as I put my arms up, the guy that was in second place passed me on the line. Learning moment, never put your arms up until you past the finish line. <laughs> it was very embarrassing. People laughed at me big time that day. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Another reason not to do it when you're passing the finish line is they have those little bumps 
at the yeah. finish, right? <laughs> and you can On the crash. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Carolyn, I think um, we're going to pass it to you. All right. Awesome. Um, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Krieger and Daniel. Um, this was a wealth of knowledge. And honestly, we only just like barely touched the surface of all of the things to learn about with this sport. Um, I will send out the recording to everyone. And like I said, you can find both of these recordings on our website. Um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out to me. You all have my email. Um, again, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Krieger um, and Kim as well for helping make this, this happen. It's been great. Thank you. Um, yeah. Awesome. See you all in Cedar Tom. Thank you. Good, <laughs> luck. Good luck with your seasons. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.